Evangelical Christians often use the term cult to describe any group that claims to be Christian but is guilty of one or more major heresies. And this is not the definition I'll be using for the purpose of this video. I'm going to define a cult as an organization or group that seeks to control its members through indoctrination and then isolate its members from any outside influences that might threaten this control. Organizations such as UC Berkeley have criteria for what makes a group a cult. An organization is a cult if it has many of the following features. 1. Love bombing. Instant friendship, extreme helpfulness, generosity, and acceptance. Group recruiters lovingly will not take no for an answer for invitations such as to Shabbat dinner. They are almost impossible to refuse without feeling guilty and or ungrateful. Love, generosity, encouragement are used to lower the defenses of a new member, uh, creating an ever-increasing sense of obligation and debt and guilt. 2. Schedule control and fatigue. Study and service become mandatory. New members become too busy to question. Family, friends, jobs, and hobbies are squeezed out, further isolating the new member. 3. Submission. Increased submission to the leadership is rewarded with additional responsibilities and or roles and or praises, increasing the importance of the person within the group. 4. Intense study. Focus is on group doctrine and writings. The Bible, if it's used at all, is referred to one verse at a time to prove group teachings. 5. Totalism. It's this us versus them thinking. It strengthens group identity, and everyone outside the group can be lumped under a single label. 6. Isolation, separation, and alienation. The group becomes a substitute family. Members are encouraged to drop worldly, meaning non-membership, friends. May be told to change jobs, quit school, give up sports and hobbies, etc. 7. Secrecy. The group hides its inner workings and teachings from outsiders. Sophisticated cults may curry media interest or even employ public relations consultants and ad agencies in order to manage their image. And most importantly, 8. Information control. Group controls what converts may read or hear. They discourage and sometimes forbid contact with ex-members or anything critical of the group. Speaking from experience, Orthodox Judaism has many of these features. There is an outreach industry called Kiruv, which seeks to turn non-Orthodox Jews into Orthodox Jews, regardless of how manipulative the organization has to be. They invite people in by offering community, fellowship, and meals. They open their homes to strangers and offer the arms of friendship. This friendship comes with a price, because subtle pressure to conform to the group's behavior has already started to settle in. One of the favorite tactics of this Kiruv outreach is called the BT Yeshiva. A normal yeshiva is a place where Jewish men around college age live and spend oh, 12 to 14 hours a day studying Talmudic law and other Jewish topics. And this happens for a few years. The BT Yeshiva is a similar idea. Young, single Jews, especially those on trips such as birthright, are invited for a free meal and a place to stay. They can live and study for years on end at no cost to them, with the only condition being that they spend a good amount of time uh, studying in classes that focus on how to conform to Orthodox Jewish law, and also indoctrination classes as to why Orthodox Judaism is true and other Judaisms are false. The real magic behind this approach is that people in yeshiva are pretty isolated from the outside world. Social psychology settles in and beliefs and behaviors of the yeshiva culture sweep into these new recruits with little outside contact to hold this transformation in check. Their worldviews become manipulated in an almost Truman Show-esque fashion. By the time they are finished in a few years, they are ready to live and believe like a proper ultra-Orthodox Jew, always living in an Orthodox community so that the indoctrination and isolation can be maintained. The idea is to make it as easy and pleasant as possible to become more and more dependent upon the Orthodox Jewish community for survival, social, spiritual, and eventually financial support. This community becomes one's entire world, and that gives the community airtight control over its members. The more integrated one becomes, the more difficult and painful it is to get out. Orthodox Jews who come to believe in Jesus often lose everything as that result. The Orthodox community is extremely good at getting everyone, 
including the person's own family, to shun such an individual. All support is cut off, and their own families will not speak to them. These Orthodox families sometimes even hold funerals for Jews who leave the community, especially if it's because they came to believe in Jesus. The reverse is almost never the same. I've met many people raised in hardcore homeschool fundamentalist Christian backgrounds who have apostatized for one reason or another and become atheists or agnostics or Jews or even Muslims. And very rarely do these Christian families shun them or cut off support. For those still unwilling to accept the idea that Orthodox Judaism is a cult, let me ask you the following question. Why is it that those who apostatize from Orthodox Judaism, particularly those born into the system, require halfway houses in order to make the transition, because they usually do. I've never seen this of Catholicism or Evangelical Christianity, or even Reform Judaism, or even Conservative Judaism, but this is very common of Orthodox Judaism. Shalom Aleichem.